It is a great pleasure for me, after so many years, 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, <coughs> to give again a lecture here uh, in uh, Tallinn. Um, my theory naturally has changed a little bit, uh, but it remains in its main elements the same. I have now, let me see, 33 minutes for my lecture. I will stop exactly at um, 11 o'clock. And uh, my lecture is a little bit too long. It consists of uh, four sections. Uh, the first section I will not present. It is the question uh, recently enormously discussed of whether my theory leads, some people say, to an over-moralization of constitutional law, too much morality. Other people say, for instance, Kai Möller, the global model of constitutional rights, Oxford, 2012, it leads to an under-moralization, the formal theory of balancing. Um, uh, can someone help me? I, I would like... Uh, to have the weight formula at the blackboard. The weight formula. Would you like a blackboard? No? Ah, this. Okay. Well, I can. Um, um, the greatest change I have introduced is uh, the weight formula which is nothing else as we always have had in balancing. And what is important? Yes, we have it here. Um, what is important? Balancing is a very old form of moral and legal argumentation. That is the one thing. But up to some years ago, it was a very unclear model. And with the means of mathematical methods, we can make it more precise. There are a number of constitutional courts in the world who, which uh, write down the weight formula in their decisions. And I always say that is not correct. It is a matter of analysis and does not belong as a mathematical for, uh, formula uh, in uh, the uh, justification of the decision. That is the first point, under moralization, over moralization. Second point already, basic elements of principle theory. Um, I will perhaps in the end of my lecture say something on this, but I will start with section three of my lecture. The dual nature of constitutional rights. The title of my lecture is a non-positivistic concept of constitutional rights. In lecture uh, section four uh, has a title weight formula and argumentation. I will perhaps can make only some remarks on this. Now I start with the dual nature of constitutional rights. Subsection 1, positivistic and non-positivistic conceptions of constitutional rights. There are two fundamentally different conceptions of the nature of constitutional rights. A positivistic conception and a non-positivistic conception. According to both, constitutional rights are part of the positive law. The difference is that in the positivistic conception, constitutional rights are only or exclusively positive law. Whereas in the non-positivistic conception, positivity <coughs> represents but one side of constitutional rights. That is to say, they are real or factual side. Over and above this, constitutional rights 
according to the non-positivistic conception, also have an ideal or critical dimension. This is not without reason. For as with all law, constitutional rights necessarily raise a claim to correctness. This claim to correctness leads to a necessary connection between constitutional rights and human rights. And it is precisely this connection that the dual nature um, uh, uh, of constitutional rights in which the dual nature of constitutional rights consists. Second subsection, human rights as moral rights. Human rights are characterized by five properties. They are first, moral, second, universal, third, fundamental, and fourth, abstract rights. That, fifth, with respect to their moral validity, take priority over all other norms. Here, only the first of these five properties is of interest, the moral character of human rights. The moral character of human rights consists in their having, qua moral rights, only moral validity. A right is morally valid if it can be justified. Rights exist if they are valid. Thus, the existence of human rights depends on their justifiability and on nothing else. What is justifiable is correct. This means that the claim to correctness raised by catalogues of constitutional rights qua positive law necessarily refers to human rights qua correct law. With this, the real dimension of constitutional rights is necessarily connected with an ideal dimension. To be sure, the moral validity of human rights can be accompanied by positive validity. Examples include not only the catalogues of rights in constitutions, but also international and supranational covenants or conventions of human rights. But such transformations of human rights into positive law never count as ultimate solutions. They are attempts to give institutional shape secured by positive law to what is valid solely owing to its correctness. Um, and uh, I add, uh, and therefore, uh, <coughs> uh, constitutional courts have the power, because of this dual nature, even to correct constitutions. Uh, the High Court of Australia inserted in the Australian Constitution um, the right of freedom of speech. Uh, the German Constitutional Court, in the 9th of February 2010, inserted a right to an existential, a social right to an existential minimum into the German Constitution, in spite of the fact that it is not positivized not written down in this sense, in the German constitution. And that was correct. But now we come to the problem with this approach. <clears throat> the second, the third subsection uh, of the third chapter has the title, Three Objections Against the Dual Nature Thesis. First, claim to correctness. 
Three objections have been raised against the thesis respecting the dual nature of constitutional rights. The first denies that law necessarily raises a claim to correctness. That is to say, law is understood by those who raise this objection as a matter of fact or power. Everybody could be different. It would be possible to have a constitution without constitutional rights which intend to positivize human rights. The world could change totally. According to the dual nature thesis, this is not possible. I have attempted to reply to this objection with the argument that the explicit negation of this claim leads to a contradiction. That is a very philosophical point. And this, however, cannot be taken up here in the 33 minutes I have. B, the existence of human rights. The, the first objection, not even a claim to correctness, is connected with law in general and catalogues of constitutional rights as a special case of this. The second objection raises a challenge to the existence of human rights. It is so the objection runs not possible to justify human rights. Not possible to justify human rights. And just to make a remark here, it is indeed not easy to justify human rights. And many people do not try to do so. They think it's clear that they exist. Well, um, many people say it is clear that God exists. And every attempt to justify, jeder Gottesbeweis, to justify, to prove the existence of God, failed. Fortunately, it is not so difficult to justify the existence of human rights than to justify the existence of God. For if it would be equally difficult to justify the existence of human rights as to justify the existence of God, we would not be able to justify the existence of human rights. I go back to my text. It is so the objection runs, not possible to justify human rights. To be sure, the critics say, it is possible to believe in them, to profess them. And this leads, if many are engaged in this way, indeed to a certain social validity. But social validity of this nature is no justification, even if it can be connected with social pressure. The mere fact that ideologies, illusions, and errors, too, can acquire social validity shows that social validity cannot be equated with justification or correctness. Social, I add, validity can change. We can, perhaps we come into a new time, and the people stop believing in human rights. And in some areas of the world, we come closer and closer to such a situation. The objection of non-existence for reason of unjustifiability can only be countered with a justification of human rights. The multifarious attempts to justify human rights can be divided into eight groups. That is to say, according to my opinion, uh, the huge talk about 
human rights, the justification of human rights, uh, can be systematized uh, by making a distinction between eight justifications. And of these eight justifications, six are bad, the first six, and two are good. My two things are good in the end. Um, the eight justifications are, we must be very short this morning, the religious um, justification, that is, on the one hand, the strongest one, who believes that human beings are created by God according to the picture of God, has a very strong reason uh, for accepting human rights. That's the strongest justification. On the other hand, it is the weakest one. For if someone does not believe in God, it says nothing to him. First. Then the biological, that we have uh, biological uh, advantages when we accept um, human rights. But that is a, not even a good. Uh, you can have enormous biological success by suppressing other people, and we have seen it in human history very often. The intuitionistic, I must make it short, the consensual justification. Gustav Radbruch had a kind of consensual justification that we have, a meanwhile, a worldwide consensus. Well, we had the strongest consensus in human rights at the 10th of December uh, 1948. That was the UN Declaration Day. There, nearly everywhere in the world, uh, people believed in different variants of human rights. Nowadays, we have broad areas in the world where people say uh, human rights are a Western, decadent uh, hobby. Consensual. Instrumental. That um, <coughs> we have a success uh, uh, that we can, uh, uh, the economy works better if we have um, uh, 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 constitutional rights. There's some truth in it, some truth in it, uh, but uh, it is not um, a, a cogent uh, argument. Um, James Buchanan has arguments in this direction. Then the cultural uh, justification, the religious, biological, intuitionistic, um, consensual, instrumental, and cultural. Well, it's wonderful if uh, the human rights are based in our culture, but it's not a justification. There are other cultures. The explicative, that is my step, and the existential justification. Here, I will confine myself to an explicative existential justification, arguing that this justification is possible. The explicative part of this justification consists of an analysis of the discursive practice. That is to say, the practice of asserting, asking, and arguing. AAA, asserting, asking, arguing. The presuppositions, the necessary presuppositions we make if we participate in a discursive practice. This practice necessarily presupposes rules and principles that give expression to the idea of freedom, first, and equality of the participants, and now important, of discourse, not of real life. That is the next step. The explicative argument however, leads only to freedom and equality as capabilities or possibilities. Thus, it stands in need of being complemented by an interest in making use of this capability. This interest is the interest in correctness. The interest in correctness. At this point, the existential argument enters the stage. And when I talk about existential argument, the um, um, uh, 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 concept existential is very unclear. I don't mean it, mean it in the sense 
uh, 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 as we find it in Heidegger or, or Sartre or Camus, I mean it in the sense that we can find it in the third part of Kant's groundwork and nearly uh, up to the wording equal in Søren Kierkegaard's Enver Order from 1800, I think, 48. Very close to Kant. Um, the existential argument concerns a decision, not an arbitrarily or groundless decision, a Karl Schmidt decision, but an endorsement of a necessity, necessary possibility or capability that defines the ideal dimension of human rights, and with this, to put it in Kantian terms, that is Kant's expression, our second part of the groundwork, our highest vocation. This justification doubtlessly raises many questions. This rough sketch, however, must suffice here. To make it uh, perhaps one sentence I add, <clears throat> the explicative argument shows that in arguing we presuppose freedom and equality. And now we must take this, Habermas says, and he attacks uh, and, um, Rainer Forst and Klaus Günther, the Habermas school, um, says <clears throat> the explicative argument is enough. I say no. Um, we must also, to take it seriously in everyday life, say yes to it. And why should we say yes to it? We must have an interest in correctness. Why should we have an interest in correctness? It is our highest vocation. It is the full form of human life. That is the ground structure of the argument. Therefore, it is not a purely what I preferred. And I would be happy if I could present to you a purely objective proof of the existence of human rights. I think that's not possible. I would give a lot if I could produce such an argument. But it is not a purely subjective argument. That is my point. It is a mixture of an objective and a an subjective argument. And that is enough for a rational justification. Next point, and last point. The positivity of constitutional rights. 11 minutes, okay, I will talk a little bit faster now. Here, the third objection against the dual nature thesis shall, uh, um, <coughs> shall be in the uh, foreground of the discussion. It maintains that to add an ideal dimension to the real dimension of constitutional rights would destroy positivity. The positivity of constitutional rights is, however, a necessary condition of the institutionalization and, with this, the realization of human rights. For this reason, the positivity of constitutional rights is a, the positivity of constitutional rights is a postulate entailed by human rights qua moral rights. Therefore, a connection of constitutional rights and human rights would contradict essential requirements of human rights. This objection <coughs> is a central point of the over-moralization thesis. It would be correct if the connection of constitutional rights with human rights were indeed sufficient to destroy the positivity of constitutional rights. This, however, is not the case. The dual nature thesis is not confined to the demand that both the real and the ideal dimension have to be taken seriously in constitutional rights argumentation. It requires, over the dual nature thesis, over and above this, that the positive or authoritative dimension of constitutional rights has a prima facie priority. From the point of view of the over-moralization thesis, the objection has been raised to this that a prima facie precedence 
would not exclude the possibility, I quote now, that the level of principles always prevail over the rules of statutory law and also over those of constitutional law. End of the quotation. The reply to this is that a prima facie priority is a genuine priority that excludes the ideal always prevailing over the real. A prima facie priority of the real or positive imposes a burden of argumentation for each deviation from what is settled by positive law. A burden of argumentation. That is, a burden of argumentation for the German Constitutional Court introducing um, a right to an existential minimum in 2010, 9th of February, or the um, 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 Australian High Court introducing uh, 10 or 15 years ago uh, the right to freedom of speech only in political questions, only in political questions, into the Australian uh, constitution. That is correct, but they had to have to justify it against the over-moralization thesis. It does not suffice to adduce material or substantive reasons that weigh more heavily than the reasons that speak on behalf of the determination of positive law in the constitution. In addition, the formal principle of the authority of the constitution would have to be overruled. There are numerous cases in which this is not possible. Examples are the abolishment of death penalty in Article 102, German Basic Law, or the uh, prohibition of torture in Article 104, 1, 2, German Basic Law. On the other hand, there exist cases in which the correctness of the decision on the constitutional right in question requires that the constitutional court goes beyond the wording of the constitution or even decide against it. An example of the first instance of these instances is the decision already twice mentioned of the German constitutional court in favor of a right to an existential minimum. An example of the latter is a 1958 decision on the constitutionality of restricting one's freedom to choose a profession despite the fact that this freedom, according to the wording of Article 12, uh, 1, 1, German Basic Law, is not subject to limitations. A correction of the wording of positive constitutional formulations. It must be conceded, uh, however, that a rational application of prima facie precedence presupposes rational argumentation. A person who attaches weights that reach to infinity, infinity to any rights, values, or goods considered by that person as moral can easily override colleading rights, values, or goods as well as the formal principle of the authority of the Constitution. This leads to the question of whether rational balancing can be distinguished from irrational balancing. With this question, the weight formula is, I write here once again, stage center. That is, what? Four and a half minutes. We have now in four and a half minutes to cast a glance again. Can you? First, uh, we have two questions. Is rational argumentation possible? First, in the justification of human rights, that they should be in the Constitution incorporated, even if the wording of the Constitution must be corrected. And then, much more in everyday life, in the application 
of um, constitutional rights if, for instance, the personality right is in conflict uh, with freedom of speech. Well, that the last question, a, a last glance, uh, the rationality of balancing. Balancing is necessary if proportionality is necessary. Proportionality is necessary if, principle, if constitutional rights can be considered uh, as optimization requirements. That is the main thesis of principle theory. Then the three sub-principles of proportionality analysis, suitability, necessity, and balancing uh, come, enters the stage. The main important thing is balancing. Balancing, um, let us consider a case, um, uh, the born murderer case. In a satirical magazine in Germany, Titanic was the name, uh, designated a, um, um, a, a handicapped, res uh, a paraplegic reserve officer who uh, was in a rolling chair uh, because of a car accident first, and he wanted to go to the army to make the summer training in the German army. Uh, and they uh, characterized him as a born murderer. In an ironical context, and in another edition, as a cripple. Well, balancing. Uh, we need the concrete weight of principle P1 in relation to principle Pj. And then we have on each side three variables. The most important is this variable, the intensity with the personality of the right of the paraplegic uh, reserve officer. The abstract weight of personality, right? And then the variable, reliability of the empirical and normative assumption standing behind the uh, classification here and here. And here the same thing on the counter uh, side. <clears throat> and we can make it very exact. We have not the time to do this here. Now comes my point. M many of my critics say that is poor nonsense. We cannot transform legal decision making in mathematics. And that is right, we cannot do it. But as Aharon Barak, the former uh, 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 president of the Israel uh, Constitutional Court said it, it brings order into legal argumentation, into the chaos of balancing argumentation. And now we can ask, how intensively is the reserve officer violated in his personality right by calling him a born murderer in an ironical context, not so because of the ironical context, not so serious, and as a cripple, very serious. And then comes the decisive point, that is the argumentation thesis of balancing. This structure is the structure of argumentation for the is a proposition, and as each proposition in need of justification, and if legal argumentation is possible at all, if it is possible at all, then balancing is rational. That is my last sentence. If legal argumentation, this is the first theme in my life work, if legal argumentation should not be possible, then we should stop being jurists. And if it is possible, then it has far-reaching consequences, not only for the self-understanding of legal science and jurisprudence and legal decision-making, but also for uh, the question of whether balancing is a rational method. The answer is clear. If legal argumentation is possible, then balancing is possible as a rational way of decision-making. Thank you very much to listen to me.